Due to illness, the roles of the nice guys on business today will be played by Senator John McCain and Carrot Top. We apologize for the inconvenience. How do you remember all the shit that you got in your head? How do you remember every one of those jokes? You tell them with such pinpoint accuracy and timing. It's it's very simple. How does a doctor know when he cuts you open what's what? It's all I know. You know, I graduated from Michigan State University in 1971 as a mechanical engineer, but I used my diploma to roll pot. Oh, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. You think I'm funny, like a clown. Do the nice guys amuse you? Need an education on how to grow your business? The nice guys are here to help. Learn about great customer service, networking, and how just being nice can help you prosper. Now, here are your hosts, Doug Sandler and Strickland Bonner. Hey, Funkin' fans, welcome back. Welcome back. We have got a big, big show today. My name is Strickland Bonner. On the other side of the microphone, Mr. Doug Sandler. You may have heard if you listened yesterday. That's Doug doing his best Jackie the Joke Man impression. Trying my hardest to do it. I don't know how the guy can muster up a genuine laugh like that at at just a moment's notice. I can't. If you've been listening to the show, you've been hearing Jackie's joke of the day on our Tuesday and Thursday shows, just like you did yesterday. Um, They're really very entertaining. And today you get to hear what? It's close to an hour, I think, isn't it? (laughs) It hurts. It really hurts. I can't do it. You don't have to. You can let him do it. He's going to do it for the next hour. Well, the reason the Jackie um, interview was as long as it was is because I spent an entire day with the the guy. I I mean, And he's interesting. It's entertaining. It was a really, it was a really interesting interview. And right following the interview, we go out to lunch, and you know, and I, it was with, it was me, Lou Diamond. Lou Diamond was like uh, Jackie and my handler in the process. He was like the connector, so he figures that he would, he would go, and and he did, and he had a great time. So we go out to, uh, we go out to lunch. I can't even remember the name of the place we went out to lunch after we had the interview. And, um, you know, so Lou ordered, I forget, maybe like a burger or something, or maybe a salad. I think Lou ordered a salad, something nice and healthy. And I ordered a, I ordered like, no, he ordered a burger. I ordered a salad. <laughs> can, you, can you tell me what kind of burger, Doug? What was on was it? Did he order it medium, up, medium rare, well done? I was just done. trying to remember. I'm just trying to make the point that we both ordered You're trying to make really the point that you can't things. remember what he ordered. Go ahead. Please continue. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't remember. Jackie orders this big fucking honker of a steak. I'm like, dude. It's like lunchtime, man. It's like, holy shit. It's like he hadn't eaten in a week or something. I don't know. So, of course, I'm paying because, you know, he was my treat right. and I, I wanted to make sure I treated him well. He ordered the whole, the biggest fucking thing on the menu, the most expensive. Now, I guess there probably was a porterhouse. He could have ordered that. Or maybe he did. I don't know. He ordered like a $60 fucking steak. <laughs> it's like crazy. <laughs> Uh, I love it. Gosh. So anyway, so so we're eating lunch and, and Lou and I spent twelve dollars and Jackie spent lunch. It was crazy. Thanks, Jackie, very much, man. You know, I'm poor too. I, I I'm not I'm not uh Howard Stern's former head writer or anything, dude. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> so you go up to New York to interview him, and then you come back home and insult him. Right. That's really nice, Doug. Very thoughtful. I, I think he'll appreciate my, my genuine nature of my comments. <laughs> and, and the other thing is this, which is really funny. So I've been, uh, Jackie and I have now just been getting like um, texts back and forth uh, in Lou, me and, and Jackie. Oh, and I introduced him to Jeffrey Gittimer too. Oh, God. So now it's, now it's like two old guys having a conversation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> These guys, they won't shut up. I'm like, dudes, can you just take me off of the, the group text, please? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to, I don't know how to remove myself from the group text. I'm like, th- those guys are having a... Like a, a kick ass time, and all I'm thinking is, does anybody work anymore? Uh, I've been I've been working all day, and and Jackie and Jeffrey, they're just like going off. I'm like, I'm glad I was able to introduce you guys. Now, can you just get a room or something? <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that was my that was my interview. I don't even remember what I talked to Jackie about. We had such a great time. We talked about Stern. We talked about his new book, um, uh, The Joke Man, Bow to Stern, and uh, what a, what a uh, a great just just a great guy great interview and um uh you know he's got like a whole bunch of he's got a ton of fans i'm looking at like some of the the um the press conference photos and there's like a fuckload of people at this press conference and he's i think by nature jackie is 
I don't think he's a worrier, but I think he is just overly concerned about where his future is going. He really wants to, you know, make it big and he's trying to figure out what is that next step. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this press conference and he's got like 50 reporters. They're all taking photos and everything. I'm thinking, there's no fucking way this guy has any issue. He's going to have, he's going to have tons, tons, tons of, um, of uh of just press and just buzz going on about his book i think the book comes out it, what's today's date the date of this episode airing what's what's the date yeah i don't know uh middle of last week of october 25th 20 oh, hang on it's right in the in the notes actually hold on i actually do know you do 25th look at that it's right here in the one note oh how about that yeah so his book came out yesterday mm -hmm. so yesterday's book comes out he, I, I'm sure he, once the book actually hits the hits the um, Amazon and, and the book and the bookstores, he'll never text me. Yeah, can again. I point <laughs> something out, Doug? Like yeah, what? relating to like how busy and how popular he must be. He, yeah, he did come on our show. He can't be that busy. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. He can't be that he in demand. He spent the whole day with you. Come on. He can't I know, be that in demand. but before, before the book came out, that's where it is. Ah. Now that the book has come out, watch what happens. Mm. He'll forget all about the little people in the world. Can I tell you what I love about Jackie? And, you know, I'm going to say this, and I don't even know if you get into it in the interview, because I yeah, heard his ahead. interview with Lou Diamond sure. on Thrive yeah. Loud podcast. He is a textbook, like a white paper on networking, right? Like yeah, before yeah. there was link LinkedIn or Twitter yeah. or any of that crap, like he just gave his album that he recorded himself. He gave yeah, it yeah. to everybody, everybody. And that's how he got his job on Stern. And his, yeah. his joke of the day, like he wasn't making any money on it, but people were like, oh, you're that joke of the day guy, right? It's like, yeah, right, I mean, it's right. he is just really, he's a white paper on networking, even yeah. before the age of social media. He was the anti-social media right. guy. He was the guy that was before social media. He was doing all the shit that we do on social media, which is giving away all your content for free right. and getting it out there. He was a great promotion guy. I wonder why. I want You know, I didn't talk about this in the interview, but I'm curious. I might have to have a follow-up conversation with him. I wonder why he didn't. Um, I forget the name of uh, Stern's agent. I think it was Buckwalt or something like that. Mm -hmm. And everybody on the Stern show, I think, had the same agent, except for Jackie. Jackie had his own agent. And I wonder if, and I, I really should have asked him this, but I wasn't thinking of it until just now we're having this conversation. I wonder if he got some bum advice from his from his agent, hmm. you know? You mean I, about, I, I know, about when he didn't go over to Sirius XM with I'm just Howard? wondering that how his life would have been different if he had the same agent as Howard as opposed to having a different agent than Howard and maybe the advice that he would have been given. Now, Jackie definitely beats to his own drum, and I respect the guy for that. Maybe he felt, you know, you, looking back, you can say, hey, this was a good move. This was a great move. This was a horrible move. Looking forward, it's like you're not really sure. So I wonder if he feels any level of, of uh, not remorse, that's not the right word, but disappointment. Or maybe he's happy. I don't know. So that, that those are some of the questions that I would that I would ask, knowing now what I know about him and reading about him since the interview was done with all of the stuff that that you know that uh, that's coming out about the book. Oh, so you did and your research after you <laughs> talked to him. That's really <laughs> fucking smart, Doug. Really I did a lot of research. I did a lot of research before I talked to him, but a, a lot of it I haven't found. I didn't find out until these several text messages that we've had since then the conversations the information that i'm finding out about it within the book i didn't get i didn't get to read the book because the book wasn't out yet i don't think he had a i don't think he had what's it called a galley copy or anything so i didn't get to read the book but i am very interested now that the book has come out in uh, in actually getting a copy and reading no, it i think it's going to be one, gonna one be of the cool. interesting things that was on lou's episode again i know apparently you guys didn't talk about it um lou diamond thrive loud this was episode nine with jackie martling he talked about sirius xm and apparently jackie was talking to sirius xm before stern was signed and Jackie yeah, was going to yeah. do his own show. Like he was going to have a regular show on Sirius XM and they were all excited and it was all in the works and everything. And then suddenly they stopped calling him and, and he was like, what, what the hell happened? And then he found out that they yeah. were talking to Stern and they basically said, look, we're concerned that this is going to be a conflict of interest. In other words, if we sign you, we're worried that Howard is going to feel like, Hey, you know, that's my guy and you kind of stole him away and it's a conflict and I'm not, and he was going to be pissed. So basically they, 
according to him, at least this was his impression of it at the time, that they cut ties with him and did not give him a deal because of the Howard deal, which obviously ended up being oh, wow. huge. I mean, at one time, I think Howard had like four stations on Sirius XM or something ridiculous. I mean, wow. it was crazy. No, I didn't, I didn't know that. I, I, he was telling a story at lunch. I hope I'm not speaking out of school here. He was telling us a story at lunch. And I don't think, again, we talked about this in the interview because I didn't find out about it until after the interview. Um, something about they made the move. Remember when the um, the Stern Show made the move over to the E Network? I don't know if you. Oh yeah, yeah, kind of like had, a reality show thing they did for a while, right? Y- y- yeah, that. Well, they had. I think it was in studio. I think oh, they had okay. an in studio version of the, oh, yeah, of the yeah. Stern Show I I think think, right. where they just captured the show on on camera. Right. And they wanted to give like I, I don't remember the dollar amounts that it was about, but it was su- such a minute amount. And Jackie's like, "Fuck that! I'm not. I'm not doing that." I, I, my agent does not. Again, part of it is was it an agent thing or was it a was it a compensation thing? I don't know. You know where the power struggle was. So when they actually record the episodes, Jackie is now. You know they have the other guys decided that they want to be a part of it. Whatever the money was, they decided that they were going to take it. And Stern took whatever portion that he was going to mm-hmm. take. And I think when they recorded the show, everybody is in the light and Jackie's light is turned off. Well, you know what's interesting? <laughs> and again, I I did I edited Lose Jackie episode like two yeah, months yeah. ago. So I don't remember for right. sure. But if I remember correctly, he said something along the lines of um th- visually, they didn't want to they didn't want the public to know how many of these jokes Jackie was feeding oh, to Howard, right? Like in other wow, words, I didn't Howard. Know that. And again, you look, you got to go back and listen to episode nine of Thrive Loud um, episode. It's a really great, great interview. I mean, probably better than yours, Doug. I mean, I haven't listened yet. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus, Strickland, <laughs> this is our fucking show. You're already tanking it. You're saying, you're, wait, in other words, what you're saying is, hey, everybody, just go ahead and hit pause on this episode so that, and go over to, you know, we have, um, this is like episode number 480 something. Just go over to lose episode number nine. nine. Okay. Okay. I'm just going <laughs> to, much better job. Much better job. Okay. I'll just, I'll just cut that out later. Hey, um, you know, lose episode <laughs> nine, is it, it was good. You know, it wasn't as good hey, as yours, hey, Doug. Hey, hey, I mean, it hey, wasn't strict, nearly as good as yours. You have so much. Hey, more experience interviewing than Lou does that your interview was tons better than Lou's but I have to edit that out though don't I like if that would actually mean work I'm just gonna right so you got uh, let me just say this right now those of you that just listened to the last two three minutes either Strickland forgot because he was in a drunken stupor (laughs) or or he got too lazy and that's why we we are right here and you heard all of what just happened (laughs) <laughs> yeah, one of those two. So anyway, so at least according to Jackie, if I remember correctly from Lou's interview, which is not as good as your interview, um, he basically said, <laughs> Howard basically said, look, you know, Jackie feeds him jokes like constantly yeah, throughout yeah. the show. And Howard yep. was nervous. He's like, dude, if if they see Jackie feeding me as much as he feeds me, they're going to think I'm an idiot. And like, he's the genius of the show and I can't have that. Right. Oh my that was gosh. the, that was what Seriously? the concern was. Now, I, again, I don't That's know which crazy. is true, but you know, whatever, listen to the interview. We'll, we'll see. Well, Jackie did mention that he has, uh, he has notebooks and notebooks right. and notebooks, every single note that he had ever written and passed to Howard, That's he crazy. has cataloged in a book. And I, I can't believe that, you know, I, well, I guess I can because I open up my second file drawer down the. That's the drawer that has all of the love notes that I've ever got received from my uh, from my wife, and I actually have every note. I've never thrown out a note ever. I, I thought I you're gonna. I thought you're gonna say every note that you ever received from every past girlfriend, both of them. <laughs> well, I have the- <laughs> both notes, not both girlfriends, both notes. Oh, I got you. Oh, all of my girlfriends. Well, that would be. Wait a minute. It's two notes. One one note per girl. <laughs> Exactly. Yes. <laughs> you know, we do have the interview. We probably ought to get to it. Um, oh overcast, my gosh, overcast, long overcast. Interview. Please recommend us on Overcast. Press the little star. We know 97.234% of you are listening on Overcast. Press the star on every single episode. We need to stay number one in business. This is such a great story of the little guy overtaking. We're beating in fucking Tim Ferriss. We've been in the top of the business category for six months, and it's all because of you guys. We fucking love you guys, and we want to keep it up. <laughs> we want to keep Tim Ferriss down. We want to keep NPR down we want to keep everybody else down because we are the king of the fucking hill on overcast i i have been enjoying the daily but they are still behind us good <laughs> and that's okay that's okay we're beating the Just new york times come on how cool is that <laughs> we are totally the david in the david and goliath exactly. saga oh my god it, this is amazing all right let's get to the interview jackie the joke man mark Ling. we'll we'll come back we'll forget the sponsorship today we, we've got we got enough money <laughs> we'll come back next week jackie the joke man mark Ling, mark Ling here on the nice guys on business podcast
If you happen to think I'm funny, follow me on Twitter at Jackie Marling. Disgusting jokes every day at 4.20 p.m. International Marijuana Time. I see everybody that knows me would say, Jackie, you've been on the air for five seconds. You didn't plug anything yet. So I figured I'd... We're in. I don't want to disappoint anybody. No, no, you've you've completely you've completely led me down the wrong path already. You, uh, who do you look like? Because you definitely look like somebody, and I can't place it. I would say Bob Saget is the guy that I always get if you're looking in the comedy world. Ouch! <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. No, no, no. That's, a, that's something something straighter than that. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Tony, who knows? Tony who Robbins. I don't know. I don't have the choppers that Tony no. Robbins has. Well, I think we should do about forty five minutes worth of. Um, Talk about visual stuff. Oh, that really, <laughs> that's really good for a podcast. Really, really Maybe you should get this on video, Lou. And for your audience, here's the newest joke I heard that I like. A couple's at the marriage counselor, and uh, the wife says, I'm really not happy in my marriage. So the marriage counselor undresses her and puts her on the floor and bangs her brains out. And he turns to the husband and said, she needs that three times a week. Can you make that happen? And the husband says, well, I can bring her Monday and Wednesday, but Friday I play golf. <laughs> I'm on a roll. I did Gilbert Gottfried's podcast last night. Uh, we did two short ones. I did it. I did one with him a couple months ago and it got one of the best responses and I've supplied him with other guests and everything. So we have a whole love session going him and Dara and Frank Santo Padre. And so I'm on a roll. I killed with Gilbert last night. So this is like small potatoes. I work with Gilbert is the icon of icons, you know. This is not the first time I've been called actually small potatoes, so it's it's okay. Yeah. It's all right. Small no, this is very exciting, and it's a business podcast, and I have a business proposition for you guys when we're done, oh. hopefully when you take me for something to eat. And uh, I'm, I'm ver- thank you so much, Doug. You are, you are it's welcome. It's so weird, though. Yeah. You're so organized. These business guys, I say I'll do a podcast. As far as I know, it's they said, here it is. You're going to sign up. It's going to be this time, and this is what you're going to do. This is what you have to do. Know, Salute now. And I said, okay, 11 a.m., blah, 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 blah. You will be here. You will have a Skype. You will have this. You will be dressed like this. I'm like, oh, God. So, <laughs> so I got 11 a.m. with you, and I figure it's an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Who knows? So I scheduled a 1 p.m., right. and then all of a sudden I, I get all these marching orders about the Skype, and I'm like, holy Christ. Yeah, you and then you said, no, 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 that, that, ignore all that. That's I'm, all automated. <laughs> okay, it's automated. I'm coming to New York. I'm like, oh, God, so I got to blow off the guy at 1 p.m. And he was such a nice guy. And I called him up and I said, listen, I got to go to the city. I'd really rather not do your thing because I know it's got to be two hours and you really, it's going to be live. He goes, Jackie, thank God. He said, I, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to miss my window working with you. He's not in Los Angeles. He's in Las Vegas. Oh, my god. He gosh. said, so I really didn't feel like laughing for two hours. I said, so it was a win, 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 win. Win, win. for everybody. Very cool. Except for the people of Las Vegas. God bless That's them. That's all right. You yeah. have it. Yeah. I, yeah luckily, bad, I didn't know anybody or there. know anybody who knew anybody. So. All right. Let's make this organized. Can we do it? You can do whatever right. you want. Thank you for having me on, of course. My my pleasure. We're actually uh, on the road today, the Broadway Comedy Club, and we are talking with Jackie, the joke man, Martling. He's been on stage all over the world, right? Everywhere? Uh, a lot of places. Uh, let's give Al Martin from Broadway Comedy Club a little plug. 53rd, right off of 8th. He gave us his uh, delightful club to record at today because <laughs> there's no room in my apartment. <laughs> and he's a great guy, and he's actually always wanted to be a stand-up, and now at the ripe old age of 60, he's going to be on a show with me. At the Looney Bin in Staten Island on December 9th, so I can't wait. All right. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, not really all over the world. I haven't worked in, like in China and, and I haven't worked in England. The only way I could actually say I worked all over the world is I did just for laughs in Toronto. Uh, I mean, Montreal a couple times and I entertained the troops uh, with Bo Bice in 19, no, in 2007. So Iraq and all around, all around fun filled neighborhood of the war. I just remember I was, it must have been the, the mid to the late eighties. And I don't know, were you in DC also? Cause I was uh, in DC from 83 to 87. No, I, I worked all over the country and my book documents this whole thing because my whole rise, which is always luck and luck favoring the prepared. If you look at me in 2001 on the Howard Stern show making gazillions of dollars on the best radio show in the world, and you go back to me in college in 1970, it's a linear path. Makes all the sense in the world right? when you connect the dots backwards. But at the time, it's like a maze. You could go way off track at any point. And I just got I got like a pinball machine. I just carried my way to the bottom. And in the middle of the whole thing. Well, I mean, you mean to the top. 
to, to the, I'm at the bottom of the, yeah, where the pinball not, goes into now, the, No, no, Jackie. Right. Today you're at the bottom. Right, right, right. <laughs> you're doing the Nice Guys on Business podcast. You were just on Gilbert's. No, this is uh, <laughs> this is the best. So what I what I meant was uh, when the pinball actually goes in and yeah, and I got you. you. But uh, in 1982, I was working at Garvin's Laughing in Washington D.C. Right, which was a very popular place, and I was. I was a comedian, but I was a hippie like my whole life. You know, I cut my ponytail to be a comedian, but I had tapes of the Eagles and James Taylor. I always told people I never bought an album after Chicago two, and I'd listen to the oldies station. So I didn't, I never listened to comedy records. I wasn't a comedy. I loved comedy. I loved watching Rodney on the tonight show, but I wasn't a comedy guy who memorized Robert Klein's album. I heard you, I heard you borrowed some money from Rodney. Is that, is that a, uh, is that false? That whole thing is completely explained in my book, you know, because nice. everybody to this day, people come up to me and say, why don't you pay Rodney the money you owe him, you idiot? You know, and I, I heard you did. And I, and of course I did. And it's like, and the whole thing gets spelled out. But Howard is such a genius at taking a piece of meat and, and, you know, taking a fish and feeding the whole world with it, you know, but let me, let me tell you what, so yeah, what happened it, as far as DC, I was working at Garvin's Laugh-In. And Harry Montecrucis, the owner, said, hey, there's a guy that did broadcast in his underwear on Friday mornings from Garvin's here. And he just got fired from the radio station. But he's going to NBC in New York. You should look him up. Yeah, Because he was at uh, DC 101. DC 101. Right? Yep. So he told me and I just sent all my albums to Howard Stern care at WNBC AM. Never heard of the guy. Didn't know anything about him. And like a couple of months later, my wife, soon to be my wife, called me up. and I was in my mother's attic, which was the first joke land. With all my dial joke machines and everything. Yeah, we'll talk and, about that. I want to get and, to that also. And she said, Frequent uh, dialer. <laughs> that, that radio guy, Howard Stern, wants you to call him. So I called WNBC, WABC, uh, WNBC AM. And Howard got right on the phone. So hey, he, had, he had moved from D.C. up to New York at that he point. He had moved up. I sent my albums there. But it took him a little while to get settled. He, he didn't call. He, I think he went up there in like November. But and you guys never me. connected while you were in D.C. No, no, no. I had no idea who the guy was. Yeah. Or anything. I, I just I, remember riding along the, uh, the the Jersey Turnpike and listening to that that iconic laugh that you have and saying, because Howard kept referring and you guys kept referring to a song that you were going to get to. You never got to the song. <laughs> right. So I was wait, I'm waiting for the song to come on the radio. It never happened. And I'm thinking, who the fuck are these guys? Just he was it, it, the guy's beyond brilliant. But uh, but he, I sent my records to him and he called up and said, listen, we listen to your records. Years later, he said he never listened to them. He's full of crap. He said, we listen to your records. You know every joke in the world. You want to come in and hang out in the studio? We're having a talent contest over the telephone. And I'm like, you know, WNBC AM, New York City. So I got in the car and went in. This was before Fred, before Gary. No, before no, his, no. Was when I walked the- in, Howard was with Fred at WCCC in Connecticut. Howard went to Detroit. He used to call Fred on the phone to do bits. When he got the job in D.C., he said, I'm only coming if my friend Fred Norris can Fred come. Fred Norris, yeah. So Fred met yeah. Howard in D.C. However long later, somebody, Denise Oliver, said, hey, you should pair up with this girl. And Robin and came Robin in. And Robin came into the equation. And when, then they came to New York. First, it was Howard and Fred. They didn't bring Robin right away, I guess. But I, I didn't know anything right, about that, right. of course. But the first day I walked in, uh, the afternoon of February 2nd, 1983, I walked in. It was Howard and Fred and Robin. Right. And the last day I worked there in March 2001, it was Howard and Fred and Robin. It was the same four of us for... It, it just seemed like, as in listening to you through all of those years that I was a fan of the of the Stern Show, it always seemed like there was... It was almost like orchestrated um, frustration. But it, I, it seemed like that, that, that tone that you always had or he always had with you was, he's like, get, get the fuck out of here. I mean, it's like... But but I know that you you guys had to have. I mean, you were with him for eighteen years. Oh, you know, he it drove him crazy. You know what happened was after that first day, at the end of the first day, they said, "Man, you are a lot of fun. Do you want to come back next week?" So I came back once a week yeah. for three years for free. Oh, good good, good promo for you. And they, of course, yeah. and not not free financially. That is right. It was right. the greatest thing in the world. And right. then I was running the club, Governor's Comedy Shop on Long Island, and like as a radio star, and I was parlaying it. And then we went, he went to mornings in February of 1986. And then they syndicated and if, right after he went to morning, I was on two days a week when he went to mornings. Right. And I went to three to four to five 
very, very quickly. I mean, the cast of characters was building quickly because right. I do well, the remember. Cast of characters right. was set in stone, and he, he, to tell the truth, he was he was funny when I was there because I was giving him lines. Well, that's what his his sister has been t- has been known to say. <laughs> Howard was not funny until until Howard met you. And then, uh, and then when I went to full time, and then they somebody suggests Andy Bloom and. Philadelphia suggested uh, syndicating and everybody said, well, that's ridiculous because radio is a local thing. And they syndicated to Philadelphia and Washington. And I don't have to tell you, it worked. Right, and then we, right. I always say we, it's not we, it's him. He went to Pluto and I was, you know, well, wait, according yeah. to some people, I was hanging on for, for dear life. And if you ask anybody else, I was one of the engines, you know, it depends on your point of view and your opinion. Yeah, I see it all as a team. I mean, I really did see the rise of Howard Stern as as uh, is you absolutely an instrumental part of the machine. But even the guys like uh, like Fred, who are a little bit more behind the scenes, although you did get to hear him a lot. I, I think he shied away from the microphone a little bit. Fred is the fastest, funniest, one of the most talented people I ever met. And his contribution to that show is not only unheralded, but nobody has any grasp of his importance. Nobody has any grasp. I, I hope Howard does. I mean, Fred is just what he brought to that show. If you dissected it, you know, the, the playing the playing the music behind the live commercials and the impressions and the he just did he was just amazing and then when me and him started working together it was lennon and mccartney and we wrote song parodies and wrote bits love those parodies and it was it was a great combination because he's brilliant and i'm silly so at the same time you were doing the radio show you were also still working in the comedy clubs you were also you doing your joke line and you were uh, doing uh, doing the parodies how much how many hours would you say that you were putting into an average week when you were in Doug, i look back now and i get tired just thinking i'm like <laughs> how the hell I have six comedy CDs out. Yeah. They're on Oleo Records. They're all the same, but they're all different. Each one is 80 minutes. They're all cut into little bands. It's funny. That when I made my first CD, I said, you know what? I'm going to make it two minutes, three minutes, four minutes. Little bands, like not like a comedy record that just runs the whole side. Because right, right. in my mind, I said, if I wind up having more than one record, more than one CD, if people put a bunch of my CDs in, they could hit random yep. on those old CD players. And then this joke, this this band will come up, and this band. So even though it'll be the same three minutes, it won't be where well, you know what's coming after everything. And so, I did an eighty minute. This all right. I'm getting up at four thirty, commuting to Bayville. Okay, I mean from Bayville to New York. Yeah, I'm doing gigs sometimes during the week and on the weekends. And yeah, because your schedule was. I was listening to your schedule when you were on the air, and you were always at another comedy club right? somewhere. And, after and the I'm show. updating nine two two wine. In the middle of all this, <clears throat> I'm headlining at these clubs. So I can't just go up and get away with it. I got to go up and do great. Right, you and, I, and if I don't kill, they're going to call. Howard never said, oh, Jackie's great. But if somebody called up and said I sucked, which they never did. Uh, he, wouldn't know, I didn't. he wouldn't have let you live, live that down ever. So I recorded an 80-minute CD. To record another CD, I had to extract all those jokes from my act and put in a new 80 minutes, like switching, switching right. plates right. in the middle, you know, switching right. rubbers in the middle of a bang. <laughs> <laughs> there you until, go. That's until, a good reference. <laughs> until all of a sudden I have enough jokes to do CD number two. The first one was the joke, man. Then I had Sergeant Pecker. And then after I put that out, I had to get rid of all six times. Yeah, I, was, I was reading so your I discography. Six, I, I, it's unbelievable. Six 80 minute CDs, which means if I was standing with you at the bar, the jokes on my last CD you wouldn't hear till seven hours in. I mean, that's not really true. But, but and the whole time I have to kill. It can't be like, hey, I'm going to try a half hour of these. So how do you how do you remember all the shit that you got in your head? How do you remember every one of those jokes? You tell them with such pinpoint accuracy and timing. It's it's very simple. Um, how does a doctor know when he cuts you open? What's what? It's all I know. Right. Right. You know, I graduated from Michigan State University in 1971 as a mechanical engineer, but I used my diploma to roll pot. You know, <laughs> all, all I've done is jokes. I started telling jokes. I, I went way back in my memory and pinpointed it. You know, I, 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 it's so great to have this all in the book. I can just say, oh, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, I just started learning jokes and learning jokes and I, I just knew them. It wasn't a conscious decision, but it was one of those things where you live in America. You probably played baseball. You probably rode a bicycle and you knew all the jokes. I was raised in America. I knew all the jokes. I thought every guy, at least, at least the guys, if not the girls, 
they, they were raised in the same country as me. They knew all the jokes. And at some point when I realized, and it was a very, you know, a, it was an actual epiphany for me. I was drunk and I jumped up on stage at Catch a Rising Star when somebody, when the stage was empty because somebody bailed out. It was audition night. We, I was in the audience. So I jumped on stage and I told what to me was the oldest, stalest joke that everybody in the world knew. And I'm in the middle of the joke and the MC, who wound up being a very good friend of mine, David Say, comes out, comes through the velvet rope and he sees me on the, he didn't stop me. And I destroyed the house with this joke and then sat back down. On the way out, he said, hey, that was a pretty good joke there. I said, yeah, you knew that joke. He said, I never heard that joke. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? You know, I never heard that joke. And I swear to Doug, I swear to God, a light bulb went on over my head. I said, wait, if the MC at Catch a Rising Star in Manhattan, in New York City, hadn't heard that joke. None of your jokes maybe, have ever been heard maybe before. Maybe there's other people that have, and it turns out nobody's heard the joke. Some people that have can't remember them. Comics can't remember them. And I just found out that I was sitting, I was sitting on a treasure trove. So Jackie's book is called The Joke Man, Baldestern. The Joke Man, Baldestern. You can pre-order at Jackie, the Joke Man. Dot com. One word, Jackie, the joke man dot com. The Amazon page comes up. It's out on Kindle. And I did, I did the audio book and Artie Lang did the forward to the book and he also recorded the forward for the audio book. You would think, or I, I would think like, I thought, what a drudgery. They gave me a nice advance for the audio book. You got to sit there and read my book, you know, and, well, you, can't, you, can't, and you can't add lib. You got to read. I, I read my I read my book and I got to tell you, it was. But for me, for a guy that doesn't spend a lot of time in a recording studio, I felt like a rock star. Now, for you, maybe it was. A, no, I can't. no. I thought it was going to be drudgery. When I was done, I, I was. Yeah, you want to do it again? I mean, I enjoyed it so much. There was such Take a good two. audience. Right. I couldn't go crazy laughing at myself. I could just, you know, but it, if you could right. have a smile in your voice and people Absolutely. can hear it. And the few jokes that are in there, I kind of giggled. But they said it was one of the best autobiographies well, read by an author they ever had. Your so. delivery is impeccable. I so, mean, it's and your storytelling techniques are are amazing. But so. it's so hard when you're when yeah, you're reading your own times, story because I got I got forty five things to say, and you know what else happened? I know. And how many times do you want to just go all you just just read? I, I so many times I had to say to myself, just read just the read. words, read the words on the page. When I I started this book so long ago that. The first forward I had, I actually started writing a book in the seventies called Profiles and Discourage. <laughs> Cause Kennedy, I was a, from the Kennedy generation. Oh my gosh. From you were, Profiles you were a Courage, hippie, weren't right? you? So, uh, and you know, it, it was horrible. And all my friends said, you know, this will be really interesting someday if you ever get famous. So I'm like, yeah, it's great when I get famous. So finally, one day my manager at the time, Rory Rosegarten said, I think Mel Berger will look at a book. We want to do a book. So I started the forward said, I'm sitting here at JFK airport at a horrible little luncheonette waiting for Gilbert Gottfried. We're going to go to Las Vegas and film the watcher, which was a pilot on the UPN superstation or something like that. That was 1994. Yeah. Never happened. Then the internet happened and I had a website. So I started writing up some of the stories that I had told. Well, a these, million are your, times these are your the, stories of your life from the Stern are- show. You know, it was so great. Because we went to mornings and before the show, me, Fred, Howard, you know, and Gary's running around, but most me, Fred and Howard would sit there for a few minutes before the show started and we'd uh, be bullshitting, you know, and right. giggling. And, you know, it was funny because I used to come in, I'd be pissed off at my wife and I'd say, I have to bring in Nancy, completely forgetting that the minute the microphones went open. Robin, you should have heard Jackie bitching about Nancy. <laughs> and, and then I'd forget. I always got caught. So. The beautiful Jenna Axelrod just walked in. Jenna? See? Did I she see, lose weight? I didn't, she I didn't see good. anybody she walk in. Well, you were so quiet. You were so quietly walking in here, too. That's I it. don't know what it is about you, uh, my friend Diamond, but she has never put on lipstick when she was coming to see me. I, I don't know. <laughs> she heard she heard six she heard six four and the buttons came way down. That's, so, all, that's, all, I, that's all I know. So we'd sit there, me and Howard and Fred, and maybe Gary, and maybe, you know, Robin was never there. She was never allowed in on anything. But we sit there and start telling stories. And Howard to tell story and Fred to tell story. And I wasn't trying to be weird or cool, but my stories always top their stories like far and away, but they really aren't believable. And I tell a story and I'd see them looking at each other like, he's fucking yeah, us. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> such but after a couple of months, 
they got to know me and they were like, this is real. Holy shit. <laughs> He's a real story. And then the stories started making. So I started typing up those stories for the web. So I had lots of stories. And then as I went along and almost got a, a book deal here and almost got a book deal there, it almost happened a few times. I had one guy wrote a, uh, a, a forward or a forward or a proposal for the book. He said, this is the greatest proposal. You're going to sell millions and nobody was interested. So well, the timing's rug, everything. Timing's the rug everything. kept getting yanked away. And finally, uh, this great guy, you talk about 922 Wine. Oh, wait. So, I, I, nice I, guy I, community, just so you're aware. 922 Wine was Jackie's phone line that used to call yes. in. Hit Right, hit his phone line. Or still is. 922 Wine, 516 922 9463. You call there, you hear me. I call that. Dirty jokes. I used to call that line in the, I think, was it the 80s? I was calling that line. It started in 79. I was that, calling that line in the 80s, and I'm thinking, who the fuck is this guy? The whole explanation of that is in the book, and that that is really, really not believable. What what went on? Well, right? my understanding is it it was just a whole bunch of phone machines, like the you well, know. Let, let, let me finish. Yeah, yeah, go. That, 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 <laughs> that is a whole. Yeah, that is yeah, a whole yeah. thing. Yeah. All of a sudden, I had two possible book deals happening, and this guy approached me, and I said, you know, thanks. This girl turned me on to this guy, and he said, and I said, listen, I, I'm so excited that you want to rep, rep my book, but I actually think I have two deals kind of fighting it. It's and of course, right. both it's deals right. fell out. Oh, I'm so embarrassed. And then like a while later, he sends me an email and said, well, how's your book coming? I go, still interested? And this guy, Peter Steinberg, I meet with him when he was a kid. Now, I don't know if he's six, eight, ten, however, this is a true story. The first phone call he ever made. <laughs> he ever made because you're a little kid. You don't have a friend. Who are you going to call? And he saw this phone number uh, and he and he five one six nine two two one was his first phone call. And here he is repping my book. We just you can't make that no, shit. No, that's up, good. You know? That's good. He's <clears throat> such and Post Hill Press took me on and they're and they've been absolutely great. And uh, so the book officially is released yeah, October twenty fourth, right? I got a book signing on October twenty third at Bookends in Ridgewood, New Jersey. I'm excited for you, Jackie. Uh, I'm so, the twenty fourth is actually at Book Review in Huntington, which is the a major place where everybody's had there, and that's the day of the release, <clears throat> and that's going to be a just an insane asylum. And then New York City on Thursday. The Upper East Side at Barnes and Noble, and then I got one on Saturday, and there's all kinds of stuff filling in. And I appreciate it. It really is generating excitement. No, it totally, it should be. I mean, Jackie, you've, you've accomplished the amount of stuff that you've accomplished in your life is, is amazing. I want to talk. Yeah, but that, all right, just hold really. on. Just hold I mean, on a I, second. Okay. CDs so let, so let, I mean, I appreciate that, but you know, you okay. Know. So, so let's just, let's talk a little about I'm the not toll. George Washington. Like, talk to me about a little of the toll that it took, you know, cause I know that there was a lot of shit going on in your life at the time. You've had, uh, you've had some run-ins with the law, just a couple of, you said it, it's fair game to go anywhere, right? So, uh, can we talk about that at all or? I went to jail six times. <laughs> they were all, everyone's a great story. They, they, I hardly touch on it in the book because when I start, this book is all modular stories. Yeah. They're all two, three, four, six pages, individual. So you can read a story and then read another story. And then chronological order, you can jump around and do whatever you want. When I wrote this book, I have an, I have a second book. I'm sure you do. Sit, no, but it's already. Oh, in you my got computer it. You done really, really I had to choose, it. pick and choose. It was Sophie's choice. Do I put this in? Do I put that in? Stories of my childhood, stories of Rodney, stories about the Stern you show. You left out jail. <clears throat> and jail will be in the second book. <laughs> <laughs> the, and it's really funny, but, um, so I actually, if people, people have said, listen, we real people like your writing. It's, it's interesting and it flows well. They might very well say, We'd like to do a sequel right. and it's, it's ready to got go. It, it really is ready to go. And I hope so because this, I keep thinking of the, the great, I, I think of a great story. I'm like, God, is that in or is that in book two or is it not, you know, cause I, you know, it's been a long life. So I'm reading, I'm yeah. reading about all the connections that you've made through the years. I mean, obviously Dangerfield was one of them. I heard you did something on stage with, uh, with Eddie Murphy that you, Gilbert Godfrey obviously is a, is a guy that you've had, uh, Sam Kinison when he used to be on the show a lot. So. Just give me a thumbnail sketch of some of, some of that those relationships. Now I don't know if the chapter on Sam is in there, but it's such a it's such a uh, you don't have to be quiet. Yeah, you can talk. You can that's talk. that's our yeah. lovely friendly uh, Amy? bar Amy? manager Janice, right? Janet, Janice. I was close. Yeah, I got Amy. <laughs> it's the, I got it's Amy the lovely out. Janice here at the Broadway <laughs> Comedy Club on Fifty Third and Eighth in glorious New York. Come here and check out a show. And there's the delivery man, handsome as hell. So I, <laughs> Strickland's going to have to edit it down. So <laughs> for years, 
I was a rock and rolling and I was in a bad band. Then I started playing by myself, playing guitar, telling my stories, telling jokes. And I ran into, it, it, this is all documented in the book. It's, it's such a long story, but I ran into this guy and he's a comedian and he said, you should come to Dixon's White House Inn. And I went to Dixon's White House Inn and met the guys. That's where I met Bob Nelson and Eddie Murphy and Rob Bartlett and all these guys. And they would come to my gigs. Yeah. I'm playing in a crappy bar room with a Fender Viber amplifier and my guitar and a microphone. But the guys would come because there was no place to do stage time. So Murphy's up there and Bob Woods and Dave Horth and all these guys. And then the guy Dixon, who owned the Richard M. Dixon's White House Inn, he actually had his face, had his face, oh, oh, that's, that's had his awesome. face surgically changed to look like Nixon. That's awesome. Would not pay us anything. That's, that's significant. He can only pay us in beer. So me and Minervini, who's still around, Minervini opens for Kevin James and he's always on Kevin's show and he's, he's standing in the movies. He's been in all his movies. Richie Minervini, the guy who I run, ran into, he said, listen, we really should start a show because Dixon won't pay us. So we started a show at a bar restaurant in Huntington on Long Island, an upstairs bar restaurant called Cinnamon that was owned by Jerry Cooney, the boxer, owned by his brother. And you we, can't make this shit up. I mean, charging, the story is we're a, charging people to get in or that you can't make that up. It's, is that a glory hole in that door? <laughs> it's a booby hole. It's a booby hole. Wait, wait. Could you put your boob through that again so we can take a photo? There we go. That's good. That's, all right, just, all right. So, I, it, Lou, can you take a photo of that so we can actually have that for our for our cover art? Just, just the fact that we have a glory hole under the employees only. Thank you for not smoking. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a Polish glory hole because it said boob height. <laughs> So me and Minervini throw this show at, at Cinnamon and we're paying the comics. You know, the people are paying like three bucks a piece to get in. We're paying the comics and we're walking away with more money than we ever deserve. The people love it. Yeah. The kid, the, the comics in the city find out about it. So they start coming out by the carload to do the show because in New York, they're getting paid six dollars and a hamburger and we're giving them 50 bucks. They're happy. So they're coming. Everybody's out. happy. And when we decide to do the show, I said, Richie, how are we going to advertise this show? We got no money. And I can still remember, I was walking up the stairs to the attic, which was the first joke land. And I said, I'll just get a phone line and we'll, and I'll tell dirty jokes and then I'll tell the people where we're working. And I went to the phone company and I said, I want to, I want to spell something. This is 1979. This is yeah, long before right, people right, were spelling. Right. You could pick your number. 833, ha ha. Right. So I said to the girl, can you tell me what's available? She said, no. I said, well, can I run numbers by you? She said, yeah. And it was, so crowded in my area it was blooming. I mean, I mean, it was booming so much that in the 922 exchange, the only numbers available started with nine, which limited me. So I had W and I was asking this, that, that, that and then I, one of the numbers I said, how about nine, four, six, three? She says, that's available. So that's how 9221 was born because it was to promote that. How many machines did you have in, in your, it, in your busiest, up, in your busiest time? Well, it wound up being 10. Um, All with the the tape, the outgoing tape, and it, the incoming. It's, it's it's beyond it's beyond crazy. The uh, your mom was what, pissed. What, the, what, what happened was, <laughs> I would record myself. Richie would MC. I always went last because I was loud and I would go long. So if we needed the time, I'd make it up. I definitely dated a girl like that in college. <laughs> I know, I know. For so sure. I'd be up there, and and I came home and I said to my girlfriend. I said, they laughed every time I opened my mouth. Of course they did. I should make a record. She said, well, don't look at me, make a record. So I made a cassette recording with me on one side and a couple of audience mics going into the other side, transferred it to reel to reel, sliced it up with a razor blade, borrowed a hundred bucks from each of 15 different people, got my class picture with me giving the finger, sent it to Nashville. And when I picked up those thousand albums at Port Authority, you would have thought I was picking up quintuplets. Like I died and went to heaven. And for the longest time, everybody's breaking my balls because I'd be standing at the door selling my albums on their Dude, way out. you were making money. You were, and all of a sudden, somebody goes, wait a minute. We made $40 tonight. He made an extra 80 with his albums. Maybe he's not that stupid, you know. Well, you're and then the, I made a second album, and then I made a third well, album. Well, it's kind of like the comic with the business sense. There's not a lot of guys yeah. that are that are like that. And the stories that go on and on. I was at a golf outing a couple of years ago, five years, ten years ago. and this guy says, Jackie, come here. You're going to want to hear this. So I come over and there's like, you know, 
10 or 15 people standing around the putting green waiting for the golf outing to start. These guys, you got to hear this. He goes, in the early 80s, I was a cab driver in Fort Lauderdale. And I got called to pick somebody up at the comic strip comedy club. Now, in, back in those days, there was no headliner, feature act. It was like three comics. You know, three comics went up one after the other, depending who. And they're all great, great acts. It was the who's who. If you look at the first two seasons of Seinfeld, 90% of those writers were people I worked with at the comic strip before Lauderdale. But I always had to go on last because I was dirty and I was loud. And they're like, and they said, Martin, we're going to a party. We're not going to sit around and wait for you to tell your stupid jokes. You meet us there. So I call a cab to take me to the party. So this cab driver shows up. He takes me to the party. We smoke a joint on the way. I brought some beers with me. I tell, told him, listen, call in, come into the, he came into the party, got stoned. I don't know if he got laid or what. This is the guy telling the story to these people. And he goes, and I took, he gave me an album. And he said, I took the album home and I, he said, it was the funniest thing I ever heard. And it was a, it said for bookings call and it had my home number on the back of the right, record. Right. So right. he called, he said, so I called this number to thank the guy for the record. He said, I got this woman. He said, I screamed for 45 minutes. It was the wildest fucking, fu it was my mother. <laughs> He's calling from Fort Lauderdale to thank me for the album. And She, must, she must have given him an earful. And I just... And, and everybody's, and he's look, he's looking at all these go rich golfers and say, no, this is a true story. You know, and this is, that's one of the people I handed a stupid album the, to. Yeah. Uh, the book is called The Joke Man Bow the Stern. The Joke Man Bow the Stern. And, uh, Jackie, the Joke Man Marling, legend in not his mind, but in our mind is, I I'm telling you, it's Please surreal. Please order one, JackieTheJokeMan.com. It comes out October 24th on Kindle and audiobook and hardcover. But if you pre-order it, it'd be really, it takes very few books to be on the bestseller list. Did you know that? I knew it. I thought it was millions. I, it I, isn't. No, no. I'll, t I'll tell you because I was there. So I know it's very few books to become. Now, so we want to get you on the New York Times bestseller, not I, just the Amazon list. We've been there. We want to put you on New York Times, right? <laughs> you Louis? wouldn't believe. <laughs> you, we've you all been there. You guys are in business. I'm sure you're the same. People that have the least bit of class would not ask you for this freebie or that freebie, right? Your friends, you, they don't ask for gas money. I have so many people going, where am I getting my free book? They're Where not. Like, buy it. I said, listen, you got to understand, if you order it on Amazon, that's a click towards my right, bestseller. Right, I'll take right. you to dinner. So not I'll a, buy your car, but order my fucking book not only, not only do we want you to order the book, The Joke Man, by Jackie the Joke Man Martling, but please take a moment, review the book on Amazon also when you get your copy because oh, it's be not great. it's not just the purchase. The purchase is great, and that'll make Jackie all of $2.32 when you buy the book, but please review it, and that'll get him there. See, you know that. I, I don't know. And you know what? And I told people, people say, I want a signed copy. So I told people on Twitter or on my Facebook or whatever, I said, just get a book, send it to me with return postage, and I'll autograph it and say well, whatever you want. So, people here, underneath, here's what we'll do. Return we'll, postage. No, you're I, the same cheap, cheap prick, Jack. I'm like, no, here, I'm going to sport for. Th I'm going to make two dollars in a book and sport for three we'll dollars. I'm nice enough to say, send it to me. I'll sign these. Jackie, just there's like, these things called book plates now. They're just stickers. We're going to get you to sign a whole bunch of those, and we'll put them in the book when they buy it. They proved to me that they bought the book. They send me a picture of it through Twitter, either to Jackie or to me. We will send you an autographed copy of that book plate that you can insert your in your book. Where'd you get this guy? He's I smart. Think, well, I, know. <laughs> I hang out with people that are smarter than me. That's God, me. he's tall and skinny, and he says he has a wife, even though he looks gay. He's no, he's no, it's a, young too. Right? Really? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the only thing that uh, the tall gay guys get is not uh, <laughs> <laughs> looking wise. So. I know. I know. <laughs> Whatever. I know. So, uh, Jackie, any fine? Yeah, well, and she's white. <laughs> and she's white. Yeah, and what can you do? <laughs> well, we just we just lost half our audience. So I was on stage with Mark. Uh, I hope with, Zuckerberg. <laughs> with Mark Zuckerberg. With, with Mark Hudson, one of the funniest guys in the world from the Hudson Brothers TV show uh, a million years ago. He's a great songwriter. He wrote uh, some of the big Aerosmith hits. And he's a great guy. And he does shows at the Iridium in New York City. And he became a very, very good pal. And he says, come up and tell jokes. So I went up to tell jokes. And on coming off stage, everybody comes up to me for my entire I tell people I'm 70. I don't tell them 69 because then I got to spend three minutes. <laughs> I spend three minutes explaining that I'm not making a, a, a 69 joke. And that's my real age. I just say I'm 70. In all my time, I've listened to every joke that everybody's ever told me. I can make a whole book about where I hold, heard what joke and why and how funny it was. And I came off stage and this guy says, listen, I've been following you for 40 years since, since the off-hour rockers in the 70s. He said, I'm your biggest fan. 
But I got to tell you this joke. I know you heard every joke. I get, and I'm just coming off stage, and the place is jammed. And, and I'm like, go ahead. You know, I always, the guy told me a joke that's too dirty for my act. The reason it's too dirty for my act is I don't do anything that slows up the crowd. I tell you a joke and you laugh and tell you a joke and you laugh. If I tell you a joke and you laugh and then you're like, oh, yeah, right, right. and you miss the next setup, right. I don't do specific, like really heavy Jesus jokes. I could care about Jesus. He's just some Jew that tripped over something. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't do a there Jewish show. I don't do a Jewish show. First you alienated do a... everybody that's black in our audience and now you eliminated all the Catholics. Great. I don't do it. A... We got the Jews left. I don't do it. No, we don't. <laughs> They, they, what we call a Jewish vagina. Go ahead. I'm ready. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what the hell we're talking? So, so he tells me a joke that, and I don't do Jesus jokes because it, if it makes people stop and think, am I going to get hit by lightning? They mix and miss the next setup. So it's got nothing to do with me I got editing it. for any other reason, but I want to keep that fucking, you know, bulldozer going. So the guy tells me a joke that's too dirty for my act, but you can tell it on terrestrial radio and you can tell it to your five-year-old. Oh. Now, imagine, and this is the only joke I know that fits that. A woman calls the doctor and she says, Doc, I have diarrhea. Can I take a bath? And he says, if you got enough. <laughs> <laughs> is that great? That's, just- that's the iconic laugh that you will get. You, I think if you open up the book, it actually is one of those laugh tracks. That's right. <laughs> that's- I, you know, they actually have things. Like, I've always wanted to make uh, those cards where you open it up and tells a joke. Oh, you can and sell your laugh to Hallmark. Yeah, they would buy I it. Just they would buy it. Wait till I tell you my idea. We're going to get rich. All right. Nice guy community. We will make sure we put all of the information how to get to Jackie's book, how to get to his website, how to get to his joke line, how to get to his the women in his life, and even some of the guys in his life, too, if you're you swing that way. So, you know, I, there's a lot of things wrong with me. That ain't one of them. Uh, <laughs> no, okay, now you've been, now you've eliminated. Now we've got, let's see, gay, black, Jews, women. Th- Anybody, you know any what? women? One, one yeah, the, women. You did the vagina of, joke. Now get rid of the women. One of the times in jail, uh, <laughs> one of the times in jail all the, all is, actually, is actually in the book. It's, it's, it's all crazy. It's all crazy. There's, there's days, like I, I was on the way here and I realized like gargantuan chunks, like there's nothing. No, since I got off the show, you know, I went to the Cannes Film Festival nine times, Sundance seven times, was in all these little movies, had so much interaction with so many. None of that is in the book. Any relationship with Stern anymore? We we send an email back and forth. You know, it's so funny. He sends me a birthday card. And it's so obvious that some he taught somebody, somebody how else. he makes his H's. <laughs> so I know it's his H. Yeah. You know, if you were going to copy his right, H, right, you know, right. like like an art theft, you know. But, and he's, and he's nice. I got no animosity or anything with him. You know, people are like, oh, you're taking advantage, right? I'm not taking advantage. I, don't, I live uh, this. Right. I don't think, th- I think that this is your story. I think but, it's. But people are writing explosive new biography and blah, blah, Let's blah. Let's sell some and, books. You I mean, know, that's I, the way I, I feel. Wrote, I put a picture up the other day of when Stuttering John did, did an album for Atlantic. He did a music video and asked us all to be in it. And Howard didn't do it, but it was Gilbert Gottfried. Barry from the, the Barry from Florence, from the Brady Bunch. Barry Williams from the Barry Brady Williams? Bunch. Barry Williams, holy shit! Gilbert Gottfried, Barry Williams from the Brady Bunch, Gene Simmons from Kiss, Sting, me, and Stuttering John, and his producer. And it's the greatest picture. And I put that in with one of my plugs on Twitter, and That's somebody great. wrote under there. Yeah, so your book bashes the hell out of the show, and you're still using it to promote well, yourself. You- and there's no bashing of the show whatsoever. I don't, where does somebody get that? They get it because they, they feel like since you've left or since you are no longer part of Stern. I have no right. right. You have no right to, to use it. That's your life. It was your livelihood and you have plenty of right to do it. And I'm glad he, even if we have a, a fraction of the audience that, uh, that most, you know, mainstream terrestrial TV and radio have, I'm, I'm ecstatic that you were on our show. So, oh, uh, please. I'm through, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, and I, you know, I have touched. So many ridiculous amounts of people along the way because most, 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 <laughs> most of them, most of them women. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> that was yeah. That's another book. That's a whole other story. That's a, boy, oh god, don't get me going. And uh, the you know, I've been sending stuff to people, and I meet people, and send stuff, and did jokes, and played rock and roll, and did favors, and did so much, and not to mention people that listened to the Stern Show in the eighties. He maintained 
like 12 million listeners. But, you know, 3 million go away and 3 million new right, ones. There's right, a lot right. of people that have been touched along the way. And I run into people, you know, they stop me every five seconds. And listen, I don't mean to bother you, but I just want to thank you for all the years of Absolutely. laughs. I said, don't ever hesitate to tell me that. It put spring in my step. Right. On the way here today, there's a woman. It's uh, Comic Con is in town. Yeah, at the, yeah, at yeah. the Javits, and it's great because everybody looks so wacky, and it's just oh wow, you gotta love it's New York. York. <laughs> and there's a woman dressed as as Superman, uh, and the Locust Valley platform. And I said, that is the greatest outfit. She says, yeah, yeah. He's like, uh, but my Superman is parking the car, and I'm like, all right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so he comes over and he's dressed as Superman too. And I said, wow, those are great outfits. And the guy says, yeah. He's I've been a fan for forty years, and we had like a. A 15 minute discussion of the show and blah, 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 blah. And oh, by the way, thank you for doing the show at the Bayville fire. I did a benefit at the Bayville firehouse and this guy was a Bayville fireman. So I got a, a guy at random who I told his wife had a nice costume. He's thanking me for doing a free show. I mean, if those people, I said, I've been sending out jokes for years and years and years. It's like, okay, free jokes for 20 years. What can I do, Jackie? Buy a book. Buy Just a book. buy a fucking buy a book and give one to your brother in law for Christmas. It's his yeah. legacy and it is I'm telling you, it's I'm gonna I'm looking forward to reading it. I really am. I wish a advanced copies were on the street already, but uh, I know there are a few in the You know they, they there might be, you know, there's they they've been some write ups, you know, some horrible write ups. It was like a write up, you know, Martin claims Stern stole his material. I'm like I was his writer, <laughs> but, you know, but then people turn and say, Hey, did you hear Martin stole? <laughs> you know. they're, they're jealous. They're jealous. So Jackie, thank you again for being a part of the, uh, part of the show today. Looking forward to seeing what well, we're, listen, what if we're you trouble get good we're getting feedback into. And people enjoyed this. We'll do it again. I would love to do it again. Deal, man. I would love you to read the book Deal. and then I'll read it. I'll endorse a, it. I'll review it. It's I done. did Gilbert last night and Frank, Third his, time he went to jail. <laughs> <laughs> Frank's Frank, uh, Sandro Padre, his producer, read a PDF of the book. So he's asking specific questions about Rodney and Louis Nye and all this stuff. And I said, God, that sounds like an interesting book. Yeah, yeah very so, interesting book. So I'm excited. And thank you. Thanks again. Thank nice guy community. Much. Never underestimate the power of nice. Special thanks to Jackie. The joke man, Martin. And you got to tell me exactly what I have to do to promote this and help you. We'll get there. And we'll figure out a way to screw Lou Diamond. <laughs> For the nice guys on business, and in accordance with my court-mandated community service, I'm Steve O'Brien. Only 27 more voiceovers to go, and then maybe, maybe they'll let me leave the state. And take this ankle bracelet off. See, this is the kind of shit that we have. We're just so everybody knows in the Nice Guy community, we are literally in a storeroom at uh, at Al's co- at the uh, Broadway Comedy Club <laughs> with with Jack. <laughs> He's already called me an asshole. Boy, he knows me already. Just so you know, uh, Lou and I are the biggest fucking wimps. We got a uh, we got Jackie the Joke Man. He is actually pulling boxes down. Um, I, I believe it's all the accounting records for <laughs> for, the, for the Broadway Comedy Club. <laughs> oh, it's tortilla chips. <laughs> Ah uh, shit! It's okay. Can I get my arm back there? So far, he's he's ordered me around. He's wearing plaid. He's actually a good-looking guy for eighty. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm batting way out of my league. I know it. I know it. Oh, uh, let me. Grab Are you that. rolling? Let me grab that arm. Yeah, I've been rolling. Oh been god! Rolling. All right, let's do it. Call it revisionist history. Call it desecration. But people all over the country are pulling down the statues of the nice guys on business. It's about fucking time.